God bless you friends. Thank you for joining us again for Sunday School on Saturday. And tonight we have a beautiful lesson, Love Divine. Love Divine. And our lesson tonight comes out of the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a chapter that is totally devoted to love. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for Love Divine. We thank you for the love and compassion that you've shown towards each of us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for every good thing that you've done in our lives. Lord, how you've allowed us to love freely and to give God freely and just to experience the wonderful love that you've shown toward us. Father, it is our prayer tonight that you would help us to love each other more. Help us to be better stewards of our love and our time in Jesus' name. And we thank you for victory now. We praise and we magnify you, give you the glory and the honor. Thank God and amen. What a beautiful lesson tonight. Our Bible truth says of faith, hope, and love, Jesus identifies the most significant Christian virtue, love. In the memory verse the first is 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. And now abide it, faith, hope, charity these three but the greatest of these is charity what is the aim of our lesson by the end of this lesson we would like to validate paul's understanding of love as the apex of the spirit-led life appreciate love as motivation to share our god-given gifts and act in love when sharing our god-given gifts and of course Paul gives us this 1 Corinthians, this 13th chapter, and he really talks about love. So before we begin reading uh, that, we want to deal with the light on the word. Who was Paul writing to? He was writing to the Corinth church. What was Corinth? Corinth was the city of Corinth, was the capital of the Roman providence of Asia which included the southern half of Greece. The ancient Greek city-state of Corinth had been destroyed in 146 BC when the Romans conquered the area. In 44 BC, Julius Caesar ordered to rebuild the city as a Roman colony. Corinth was a major trade city located on an instance a narrow strip of land uh, that connects cities to northern Greece like Athens and Delphia with cities on the Peloponnesian uh, Peninsula, like Sparta uh, and Olympia, Corinth was a bustling business and cultural center because of marine time trade on the Aegean Sea. To the east of the Gulf Corinth of the West, Corinth was socially, culturally, and religiously diverse. In fact, in AD 49, Jews who were expelled from Rome resettled in Corinth. The Christians of Corinth reflect the diversity of the city. Um, congregations included wealthy persons, merchants, slaves, and former slaves. During the time that Paul wrote this letter, Corinth was known for its wanton sexual immorality. Now, people in Corinth lived an immoral life. They lived so immoral until Paul had to write on one occasion, it has been reported to me that there's fornication among you commonly. Paul was constantly addressing the issue of fornication in Corinth. He was constantly having to address the Corinthian church because morality was in that church. And the reason so much morality was in the church is because the church had members of various backgrounds. As I just read, some of them were wealthy, some were uh, poor, some were slaves, some were uh, uh, former slaves and former slave owners. I mean, the congregation just varied. Now, when you have so many backgrounds that intermingle, you have a different climate and culture in that church. 
And the climate and culture that was in the Corinthian church was a culture that Paul had to address. He had to address it because he was not saying that Corinth could not be saved, but he was saying that if y'all keep doing the same old thing, then you're not going to be saved. You must straighten up your act. And I believe that even now, nowadays, we're living in a time in which the church must straighten up its act. We must straighten up, in the words of the, uh, the cliche that says, straighten up and fly right. We've got to straighten up and act as true believers in the body of Christ. So then, what does Paul do? Paul, he wants to address the issues. He addresses all the issues that are going on in the Corinthian church. But then he says, you know what I've got to do? He said, I've got to let you know what is the greatest Christian gift that you can have. Whether it be speaking in tongues, whether it be dealing with mysteries, whether it be dealing with knowledge, whatever the case may be. He said, I've got to let you know what is the greatest gift that you can have. So he begins by talking about agape love. What is agape love? Paul wrote 1 Corinthians while he was living and ministering in the city of Ephesus. The letter was written between AD 53 and 55. During his time in Ephesus, he had also received a letter from the church at Corinth expressing confusion about marriage, divorce, corporate worship, bodily resurrection, and living in a pagan society. Paul wrote the Corinthians... Um, Paul wrote to encourage the Corinthians and to emphasize the importance of holiness. He also wrote to correct their misunderstanding and abuse of spiritual gifts, which he discussed in chapter 12. Chapter 13 is often misinterpreted, which leads to its improper application as merely an ode to the virtues of love. Paul was using 1 Corinthians 13 to address specific issues in the Corinthian church. Selfishness, division, abuses of gift, and envy. The Greek term for love in the King James Version, charity, used this chapter is agape. This word is closely associated with the Hebrew words chest, which often refers to God's covenant love for his people because of this association. Agape became the key word for describing God's character and took on the meaning of divine love that is intensely loyal. Believers should emulate this love. Now, love is superior. Love is superior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses one through three, it says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So Paul begins to talk it doesn't matter how much you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter what gift of prophecy you may have. It doesn't matter how many mysteries you may understand, how much knowledge you may have. It doesn't even matter about the amount of faith that you have. It doesn't matter what gifts you have. If your love cannot or do, do not supersede, amen, the gifts that you have, if you cannot show love, if you're so interested, how can you speak in tongues all the time and never bother to speak to that person that's sitting next to you? How can you go around prophesying and laying hands on people and yet you're just as mean as a barrel of rattlesnakes? How is it that you can have so much spirituality about yourself, so much spiritual self-esteem and self-worth about yourself, you know, that you all appear spiritually but yet you do not love. Love is key. If we're going to be saved, 
we must exemplify love. Light on the word. Love is essential. Spiritual gifts can be destructive when not practiced in love. Let me say that again. Spiritual gifts can be destructive when not practiced in love. Love is what enriches the gifts and give them value. Whatever our gifts, love should be the motivating factor that is pleasing God, our objective. Paul explains the character of agape to the Corinthian church in the King James Version. The translation of agape is charity. When we think of charity, we usually think that giving to others is an active expression of Christian love. But this is not the full meaning of charity. In the King James Version, charity relates to the word cherish. To show charity to someone is to show that you cherish them, which goes beyond giving alms and offerings. As Paul explains, when Paul speaks of charity, it is love. More importantly, Paul is speaking of a specific form of love. He is not talking about eros, the sensual or erotic kind of love, nor is Paul describing philia, a brotherly love or friendship. Paul is speaking of agape, a commitment to the will to cherish and uphold another person. Love that describes God's love. Agape is our intentional decision to treat others with the utmost care and concern and esteem the best interests of our brother or sister above our own. Yes, we must esteem what our brothers or sisters need. We must love them in spite of everything, in spite of all things. That's why one songwriter said he looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Now, love's characteristics. What are the characteristics of love? 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 7. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. There are certain characteristics of love. Love will make you look over someone. Love will make you look past their faults. One scripture says in the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5, and I believe verse 8, it says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Therefore, we must understand the characteristics of love. Paul sums up his elaborate and poetic description of love in verse number 7. What does he say? He says, love bears, believes, hopes, endures all things. Paul's use of language implies that love must be active at all times. Love beareth all things. Ooh, my God, love beareth all things. It will stand the assault and protect those under its spirit of influence. Love believeth all things. It is always willing to give the benefit of the doubt. Love hopeth all things and does not despair. Love endureth all things, including temptation or tempting or testing. Now, in Corinthians, look what it says. Look what it says here, verse number 8 through 13. Charity never fails. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, uh, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now about it, faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's practice love. Paul highlights the character of love as Christians should express it. His descriptions of love are active indicating that love is something one does, not merely an emotion. As Christians, we have received the love of God. Therefore, we are to love others. Contrary to what many may believe, love is not an abstract notion. Love is practical and must be put into practice daily. Christians must always be aware of their actions and ask themselves, did I show love in that situation or toward that person? Paul explained that love results in characteristics that can be seen and heard. Love is evident in the words we speak to one another, whether the discussion is about personal concerns or business concerns. Being professional is not an excuse to be rude. Leadership is not a license to cut others when, uh, with, with stinging words A person who loves Does not speak his or her mind But minds his or her speech Well that's just the way I am Whatever on my mind That's what I'm going to say No you can't say whatever come to mind It can't be whatever come to mind baby No you are going to have to tame your tongue We had that Sunday school lesson not long ago in the book of James, where James talked about taming the tongue. You must learn how to tame your tongue. Love will teach you how to tame your tongue. A person, again, let me read that again. A person who loves does not just speak his mind, but minds his or her speech. Could well, could, uh, well be a place called in every conference room, especially where Christians are gathered. Love does not go around hurting others' feelings. It always uses tact and politeness, which is a sentiment that seems quite forgotten today. Listen to how we speak to one another. There is a lack of politeness and gratefulness. The climate seems to encourage everyone to tell it like it is and be tough as if crudeness is a show of strength. May God help us to cherish the qualities that are Christ-like, that we may repent every time we think we have the right to be rude. Remember, Jesus Christ is also sitting at the table and he is listening. Nothing gives us the right to be rude or disrespectful to anyone. Nothing gives you the right to mistreat any person. We must always remain respectful. We must always remain polite. We must always remain gentle. The scripture has declared, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Yes, beloved, we must learn how to tame our tongue. We must learn how to practice this word, love. Love endures. Love surpasses all of the other spiritual gifts because they will pass away, while love endures forever. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are limited. There will be a time when gifts will not be necessary. The Spirit gives gifts for the building and maturation of the church. We will not need such things in heaven. Corinth was well known for its bronze artistry and bronze mirrors, and the reflection is imperfect. We exercise our gifts imperfectly. 
Our knowledge is as incomplete as if we are looking through a bronze mirror. However, imperfection will give way to perfection and we will see clearly, perfectly in heaven. We will experience love eternally because love is eternal and is superior to the other spiritual gifts. It is childish to focus on spiritual gifts to the exclusion of love. Not only is love superior to spiritual gifts, but it is also superior to faith and hope. Just as in heaven, we will no longer need prophecy or tongues. We will no longer need faith when we finally see God. All hope will be fulfilled. Charity never fails. Yes, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The verse began Paul's conclusion to the topic of love. He has been addressing the overemphasis of the Corinthian Christians on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Here Paul attests to the permanence of love as he continues to put the spiritual gifts and virtues into perspective. Love is eternal. It never comes to an end. It is permanent. The gift in which the Corinthians pride themselves are transit at best, but love is transcendent. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts as instrument for this age. Paul anticipates that we will not need these gifts in the next age. When Christ returns and fulfills the reign of God, prophecies, tongues, and knowledge would be unnecessary. Love, on the other hand, on the other hand, is essential and will never pass away. Love like God is complete. The scripture says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. God doesn't always show us the full picture. He gives us bits and pieces. And he allows us, amen, to put things together, or, or try to put things together. But beloved, it's not difficult to love. No, it's not difficult to love at all. It may be difficult to interpret tongues. It may be difficult to speak in tongues. It may be difficult to understand mysteries and knowledge and put riddles together, but it's easy to love. Oh, we must learn how to love one another. Yes, so he said these words. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, Paul said, it was time for me to grow up. And as spiritual believers, beloved, it's time for us to grow up. We cannot afford to allow anything or anyone to cause us to be immature in Christ. Our maturity level is important. We have so many babes that are still in Christ who have been in the church for years, but yet they've not yet grown, yet they've not matured. As believers, we must mature. How do we grow? How do we mature? How do we develop? The only way to do that is by studying the Word of God. We grow through studying God's Word. So Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Do you not know it's time that we put away childish things? That we put away foolish things that we put away immature things they we put away things that are not beneficial to the body of Christ things that are not beneficial to our spiritual growth and development yes so Paul said now for now we see through a glass darkly 
but then face to face. Now I know in part. Whew. My God, I know in part. But then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth these three. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. After everything has been said, here's the conclusion of the matter. Spiritual gifts are given for a particular purpose and for a specific time. It is childish to esteem them too highly. We like the Corinthian Christians must remember that giftedness is not a measure of maturity. The display of love is. What good does it do me to prophesy and speak in tongues around the whole church? And when I get through speaking in tongues, I can't speak to you. What good does it do for me to dance and shout around the whole church? And yet I cannot obey the word of God. Those gifts are useless if it does not bring me to spiritual maturity. What brings me into spiritual maturity is love. Jesus said these words, a new commandment give I unto you, that is, that you love one another. Jesus is coming again. It is by faith that we are saved according to the grace of God. In hope we wait upon the return of Jesus and the coming of the reign of God. All of this is due to God's love for us. These are what remain when one matures in Christ. When Jesus returns, the reign of God is fulfilled. We do not need hope when we stand face to face with God. When we see that there is to see, we will not need faith. We will continue to love and be loved by God. Love never ends. It is eternal and the greatest gift of God. Hallelujah. Let's dig a little deeper. Over 500,000 children in the United States currently reside in some form of foster care. Two thirds of these children are African Americans and they stay in foster care longer than children of other ethnicities. The average time black children live in foster care is 10 years which mean they become institutionalized and they are living in group homes. The challenges of these children are complex and may include blaming themselves and feeling guilty because they were removed from their birth parents. Children who are living in foster care, which is more descriptive than calling them foster care children, experience rejection when they are not adopted. And rejection results in feeling unwanted. Over time, children feel helpless, especially when they are taken from, the, from foster home to foster home and experience dozens of changes in foster parents over time. These are our children, and they are in desperate need of love. Since love is action, everyone has the opportunity to express love by doing something. Feeling sorry is not enough. How can you help? Become a foster parent or an adopted parent. You must be over the age of 21 and financially stable. Uh, and you must meet certain safety requirements such as criminal background checks and child abuse screening. There are no preferences made to race or ethnic origin. Educational background, marital status, occupation or home ownership. How might helping or even fostering these children show the love of God? Consider becoming a foster parent and encouraging your church family to actively take the lead in the community to be advocates for the least of these. When we show love to someone who cannot return the favor, when we show love to people who cannot love themselves, that is the greatest gift that as believers we can display. Well, friends, I hope tonight that something has been said to encourage your hearts, something that's been said to make us want to love a little deeper, love a little harder. I thank God for you on tonight. I thank God for you joining us, and I do look forward to sharing with you, amen, on next week, same time, same place. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Father, for speaking to our hearts. We thank you, O oh Lord, for everything that you have done, every gift that you've given, especially the gift of love. For you've taught us how to love. You've shown us how to love. You've shown us that in giving your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that you've loved us. Now help us, Lord, to continue to love each other, to be those examples that you would have for us to be in Jesus' name. And we shall praise and magnify you, give you the glory and the honor. Lord, these and other blessings we ask on tonight. Thank God. Amen. Well, friends, be sure to join us next week, same place, same time. Until then, be blessed is my prayer for you and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the evening. God bless you. Mm -hmm.